Good afternoon, everybody. I wonder if I could ask you to do something for me, since it's uh, that time of day. I wonder if you could all just stand up for a moment. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Great. And relax. Take a seat. So two things happened just then. One is that I asked you to do something. I, I gave you a directive, a command, if you like, uh, an imposition. I imposed upon your good nature. Uh, and thank you for that. You don't always get thanks when people impose upon you, but I'm thanking you. And the other thing was that there was some meaning attached to that change that happened when you responded. And that was that uh, my intention was that you would feel a little bit better, you'd wake up a bit, maybe you wouldn't fall asleep during my talk, and it would be a precursor to the coffee which is coming in just a little while. Okay, so there were two things. There was a change, something I could call dynamics, because I'm a physicist, and there was semantics, or the meaning, the purpose, the interpretation of what happened. And that came from me. The meaning was from me, for you, and you responded nicely, and I'm grateful. Now take a look at this picture. You've all seen this before, right? This could be any city in the world. It could be a you know, typical Chinatown. It's a kind of a slightly unruly ecosystem of services, uh, advert advertisements, advertising, the billboards, there are symbols, there are messages going on, and there are people, importantly, there are people in the picture receiving these services. If we think a little bit about a couple of years hence, Internet of Things that we've been talking about, technology behind the scenes. Remember Mark Weiser's famous statement about the important technologies are the ones that disappear from view, the ones that are in the walls. Here you can probably spot the smart glasses, you know, which are beaming uh, smart display into the woman's eyes. And of course there's a smart surface that they're, they're touching and, and interacting with, ordering their burgers and uh, smart food, maybe not burgers, but they're smart salads, that must be what it was. Um, we've got the smart TV set, we've got the, the, the shop front with this, the smart advertising, they're of course wearing smart clothing, lots of services. And of course our society relies on these mechanisms and on these services to function in a, in a way. And this is a little snapshot of an ecosystem, a mixture of human and machine services, of software services, of information services. A very, very common kind of picture. Um, and you can ask, how do we manage a system like this? How do we control a system like this? Maybe we just step back and let it evolve by itself. In this case, you know, your typical Chinatown doesn't have a, a central management committee that decides who's gonna put up which signs and which ones will be lit at certain times of day. It's kind of take it or leave it, it comes by itself. It, it's organic, we would say. And the scene kind of looks a bit like a, a jungle of some kind of description, a technological jungle. But the typical answer we have in IT when we ask how to control a system is to try to establish a central command and beam commands by brute force to all of the actors and ask them to comply just like I did for you when I came into the room. The only reason that works is that I've got this big microphone uh, amplification system and I can flood the room with the sound of my own voice. That doesn't work if I try this for the rest of New York. If I ask everybody in New York to jump up and down right now, I'm betting that not many people actually did it because they can't hear my voice. I can't flood that far. This brute force mechanism of trying to get people to cooperate doesn't scale very well. So there's an interesting question here, which becomes more acute as we increase the sort of density and complexity of an environment like this, which is how do we manage this? How do we control it? How do we get it to fulfill an intended purpose? And so that's the question that I want you to think about. And the answer has something to do with what Jeffrey West was talking about this morning. In many ways, my talk is quite similar to his, but I'll say it in a slightly different way. And instead of focusing on the long-term trends and the meaning of these long-term trends, I want to get down to the microscopic level or the mesoscopic level, 
the level at which we interact with society and the things around us to create meaning, to create purpose, to create business. So let's step back just a little bit and think about you know, how does this work? How do we scale some sort of an enterprise from uh, its beginnings to some sort of commoditized um, infrastructure? And the way that it happens is that we begin, we don't, know what, we don't really know what we're doing. We find an opportunity. For example, there's some berries in a forest that we want to pick and, and market these things, sell them. And the first thought that we have is that we will go in with our hands and we'll pick these things by hand and we package them and we sell them. This is fine. We throw a bunch of workers in in the summer, you know, student holidays, people picking berries, we sell them. At some point, this doesn't scale very well and we think maybe we can implement some technology to help us. So then we design, we productize, we, we create systems and we try to improve and we can try to scale those up by brute force. Eventually, way down the line, when we get to, we go through this sequence from experimenting to customizing to productizing, and then eventually commoditizing. You know, when we figure it out, how to, how to do this really well, stripping away all of the irrelevant parts, we can make it efficient. And that's this sort of hydroponics farm at the left, on the right, sorry. Um, it kind of looks like what happens in IT as well, right? So we start out with a bunch of computers. We don't, you know, we just set up a bunch of computers. Maybe we can use them for something. We install an app. Maybe this will help us do our accounts or uh, help us to sell something. We start opportunistically using the IT system, uh, thinking that it's going to help us out. Eventually, we, we streamline this thing to the point where we've got data centers. And this looks kind of like a data center too, right? And there's a reason for that. We homogenize the entire process, make it really utilitarian, and we can scale it up in an efficient way. And I think what's important is that the left-hand side looks like us. It's manual, it's hands-on. It's like us wanting to do the job, to be hands-on to do it. And on the right-hand side, we are gone. The humans are gone. This is the utility process where we're, we just step back and let this thing run itself. And this is an important thing to understand about the evolution of technology. In the beginning, we want to be in there doing it for ourselves. We want to be the technology. We want to be in control because we see the world as an extension of ourselves. And eventually, when we try to scale it up, we realize that that need to be involved actually hinders the scaling, and we end up more like on the right-hand side. Through the productization phase, an interesting thing happened. You know, that story about humans wanting to be in the picture kind of gets in the way. On the left, again, this is what hi fis used to look like in the 80s. Uh, we'd stick as many buttons and knobs and things on it as we could because we want people to be fiddling around and people want to be engaged. They want to make the sound better, you know, turn up the bass. And then today, they look much more like this on the right-hand side where you can deliver the perfect sound experience with no knobs, no nothing at all. Just uh, by evolving the technology to the point where everything is taken care of. And you've seen the same kind of trends with PCs, with Apple, uh, with the smartphones, and so on. So what we want, you know, as people, we, we kind of think we want tools to make ourselves more powerful. And our vision of making technology better is the Ripley power suit from Aliens, you know, where she gets into this suit and she can lift huge boxes. But that's not a very good way to move boxes around, you know. Uh, this uh, archive, tape archive machine, robot, is a much better way to stack objects. And we had to talk about containers uh, earlier on where machinery can pick up these standard sized containers. And homogenization was the, the issue there, the standardization of the containers. We make everything uniform, standardized, lay it out in a homogeneous rack system, and so on. And this is how we industrialize and scale up. And again, correspondingly, this is like picking the berries with the Ripley power suit, a bit overkill maybe. And the homogenized hydroponics data center version of uh, technology on the other side. Often what needs to happen in order for technology to evolve is that humans just need to step aside. 
but it's hard for us to do because we are the ones who came up with the ideas. Ours are the intentions. Technology is for us. It's a proxy for us. And if we only focus on the idea that we're taking humans out of the picture, it's easy to feel kind of, you know, this doesn't sound like a good story. We're trying to put people out of work, take away their livelihoods, their sense of purpose. That's not true. Technology is this proxy for our intent. And that means that we need to keep in mind our intent as we build scenarios to make, uh, to scale up, industrialize, and commoditize. But often, significant innovation in this area doesn't happen until people are willing to step back and move away. I love this picture because for me this symbolizes um, what people, what, what is the psychology of us and then how, how we make uh, systems that actually scale and make our lives better. Flood happens, unexpected uh, situation happens, a flood. On the left, uh, left hand side, men come with tools. You know, men will solve this problem. They wait until it happens and then they come. We will solve this problem together. You can see they're very busily engaged in this and they have a tool. We're gonna engage with a vacuum cleaner. We invent technology to suck up the water. It doesn't scale very well because they've got to sort of follow all the water around like this and it's a very centralized singular solution. Um, but I guess they might you know, sort it out eventually, and a couple of times they'll do it. Eventually, some smart guy figures out that, you know what, if we just built the, the system to begin with to promise to sort out this, to handle this problem in the beginning, we would never have a flood in the first place. Enter the storm drain, which is my view of what true automation looks like. Not the Ripley power suit on the left, but true automation is that thing which blends into the walls that nobody notices until it's needed. That's the thing that makes the water simply go away with no human involvement. And we step back and it makes our lives better. No humans need to be wasting their time trying to figure this out, being woken up by pages in the middle of the night. So this is um, a kind of a radical way of thinking. And for me, as a physicist, I looked at IT systems and I saw how we were uh, sort of the narrative of the day when I started this in the 90s was that computers do exactly what we tell them, right? They do what they're programmed to do. Any of you knew, know here that it's a good day when a computer does anything like what it was asked to do. Most of the time it'll do something like that, but it has other stuff going on. As soon as we connect something together, connect to the internet, it's got all of these signals coming in, interrupting it, destabilizing it, all kinds of stuff can happen. So, as a physicist, I thought this idea of imposing commands on computers from the outside doesn't make a lot of sense because just like when I came into the room, imposing commands, you know, the, the computer might not be listening at that moment. It might not hear my command. I have no feedback from it about whether it heard the command or not. Like when I'm trying to command New York, it just doesn't work. But I don't know if maybe some people jumped, maybe they didn't, we just don't know don't have that information. So what's needed is to turn this model around. So I came up with a model which has come to be known as promise theory. I didn't deliberately call it that. And I uh, had a, a meeting recently in Silicon Valley. I drew this little cartoon on the back of an envelope, literally on the back of an envelope, uh, to, to, to explain the essence of it. And of course, being a physicist and a theoretical physicist, I write promise theory as lots of algebra and mathematics. But the essence of it is kind of here. And that is, you know, the traditional way of thinking of command and control is this fist coming down from God, like, make it so, Captain Picard, you know, make it so. And doesn't say please, make it so. That's uh, an uncertain way of giving commands or directing a system, a technology. We don't know if the agent underneath hears the command. If it can't respond or if it's unwilling to respond, maybe nothing will happen. We just don't know. So we don't have a good expectation of what will happen. On the right-hand side, let's turn it upside down. From the bottom up, look what I can do. Every agent in the room says, this is what I can do for you. Take it or leave it. Now, 
we have accurate information from the source of every one of the parts of the system about what it is capable of doing, what it is likely to commit to, and we have a much better idea of what the outcome of this is going to be. Now we can formalize this idea and take it further. And there's a bunch of things that we can go through to do that here. It says, we ask, what is the seat of agency? What is the thing in a system that is capable of making a change or implementing something? And each, we treat each of these agents as being independent, autonomous, individual, self-governing, if you like, self-healing, uh, somewhat independent. And then we ask, what can we, what, can, what does it promise? What can I rely on from that piece of the system? And how can I use that? Is it a man or a machine? Who cares if it's a man or a machine? Often we're, we're stuck on, you know, is it a computer? Is it a person? Is it a dog? Is it a horse? Is it a domesticated donkey? What, it doesn't matter what it is. If it keeps its promise, we can rely on it to carry out a job, perform a service, run a business. So, the idea of promise theory is to turn system into these atoms, these agents. Doesn't matter what their nature is, if they're humans, machines, or whatever. The, the important thing is what are they promising to do and how can we use that? And understanding systems from the bottom up like that instead of from the top down turns out to be much more easy to rely on and scales much more easily to large size. Somewhat like the uh, examples I showed you a moment ago. Well, let's think about this for a second. Step back and, and look at how this has happened in biology. This is kind of interesting because in biology, we have organisms. Um, we are organisms. The largest organism is the blue whale. This is also in Jeffrey's slide. This is a, what we call vertical scaling, where we take a system that's designed in a certain way and we try to blow it up to a large size. Now. I, drew this, I, I put this slide in because you see all these different kinds of uh, organism. I'm not quite sure where the space shuttle fits in here, but, but these other organisms um, have very different sizes. You have us, you have triceratops, you have a shark, we have the blue whale. But there's nothing bigger than a blue whale. This scales out, it reaches a maximum size. And the maximum size comes because it has a brain which is pushing commands to its extremities. And at some point, it takes so long for those commands to get to the, the other end of the organism that it just can't respond fast enough. You notice that the larger animals get, the slower they become. That's because it takes time for signals to travel and for flooding of commands to, to pass through the system. So this has limited scaling properties. What it's good at is having brains, because brains allow us to, to change our minds quickly, to analyze information, to centralize, um, calibrate, uh, and so on, and have a very particular point of view. This is why we're successful as organisms. But it still doesn't scale. So then there's another approach in nature, which is the society model, the insect model, the ant model, if you like, which is a decentralized approach. Instead of having a single brain, you have a lot of um, agents which are uh, rather dumb, if that's not a pejorative term. It's, you know, these things are not very sophisticated, shall we say. But there are many, many of them. This is what we call horizontal scaling. And with very simple rules, and with just making promises to follow very simple behaviors, they are capable of extraordinary feats of engineering, like transporting objects uh, many times their size, which become, by the way, involved in the process themselves. This kind of system is what we call emergent behavior. And we, we say it's emergent because it was not intended by any particular part of the system. And yet it exhibits somewhat intentional behavior. The outcomes appear to have been intended, like moving the stick, uh, feeding the queen, uh, shifting, you know, making enormous uh, structures. So there are different ways of running systems. There are these intentional command-based things. They don't scale very well. And there are these very scalable horizontal scaling things, which are somewhat hard to understand. In my work, I've gone more in this direction. But there's often cause to go um, in both directions. And as we create technologies for society to rely on, because we need all of these services, these tools, 
these interactions to make society work. We need to ask what kinds of systems should we be building? We're still building blue whales, but there's room now to understand how to build other kinds of systems as well. So the question kind of is, you know, what kind of creature is business? Or what, is, what kind of creature is your business? Is it small enough to be an organism with a well-defined boundary? Or is it a collection of independent agents loosely coupled through simple rules and mostly autonomous behavior? How are we going to scale that intent? In my, uh, my work as a physicist, I suppose you could say, the way I look at it is this. What science has tried to do in the past, what Jeffrey showed us this morning is, is to take systems and analyze them at a coarse grain level, at a broad level, and look for measurable things. But there are also aspects of systems which are not easily measurable, so-called qualitative uh, features of systems, which are not that easy to measure because they're hard to define. You know, but they're things that we intend. They're purposes, they're meanings, interpretations, very important parts of systems to human the functionality of something can be hard to define or hard to measure, and yet we need to be able to do that if we're building a society based on cooperation. So what promises allow us to do in technology and in human management as well is to say, let's just consider a system as being a bunch of actors, agents, loosely coupled with a lot of freedoms to, to operate and see how we can constrain them in different ways to ensure an, an outcome, to engineer an outcome so that it, um, it delivers the result that we want. We might not understand all the details step by step, but we will get the outcome that we want and make sure that it will scale to that large size that we need to do as a, as a company grows or as a city grows. I thought Jeffrey's uh, talk was fascinating because for me, a city is just, it's an operating system, right? For people living in, in buildings. It's the, the Linux of um, human life. Or if you like, Linux is the society of computer interaction. This is the way in which we exchange resources to share commodities, uh, communicate with one another in a cooperative way. Uh, and so you would expect, on the basis of the kind of universality that he showed through measuring all kinds of different systems, you would expect that there would be some uh, lessons to learn from and which would transfer from one to the other. And I believe that this promise theory approach does that and gets down to the quite detailed, low-level purposes and semantics within the system as well. So. You know, here's another example again. When we think about performing operations on some part of our environment, carrying out an operation on a human, for example, our first, the first way medicine was done was to bloodletting, you know, stick, sticking knives, trying to pull stuff out of people. This was the way we did medicine. It's very invasive, it's destructive, it's intrusive, it's, uh, it doesn't scale very well. You can only operate on one person at a time. So this is a terrible way of interacting with the world, and yet it's what we do. It's our first instinct is to jump into the left and put our hands in, get involved in the system, because we want the world to be an extension of our will. It's part of our brain, same signals being pushed out. But then we step back and we find the hydroponics version, the data center version, the homogenized, scalable version, where people step aside and we discover pharmaceuticals which work from within, the agents from within the system. And the way to scale any system turns out to be very simple. You get every independent agent in the system to independently promise some property like no headache. And if you want to adjust that programming or that set of directions or that intent, you can change the promises or you can negotiate with these, with these agents in the system to deliver different promises. But the great thing about this is that this is true without any kind of manual intervention. Nobody had to wake up a surgeon to do this. This is easily available. It can be continuously applied. 
there's no schedule by which this stops working. It's not fragile to the, to the um, sickness of the, the surgeon. So what I'm trying to get at is the way we, com we consider command and control, or if you like, just how we impose intent upon the world, create proxies for our wishes, uh, we need to rethink the way we do that because the traditional mechanisms that we've basically done by brute force, they don't scale terribly well. So here's you know, a laundry list, if you like, of technologies which uh, represent the old and the new world. And some of them, you may recognize some of these, you may not. These are from the world of IT. But many of these have been products or design principles which have been based on the old style, centralized, push-based thinking. And then the new world on the right-hand side where uh, we see a number of trends emerging now in IT taking heed of these lessons like Docker, by the way, containers in IT as well, that, that that's a thing. Um, pull instead of push, you know, what, what are you gonna give me instead of what am I gonna give, what am I telling you to do? Microservices, interacting constellations of services voluntarily cooperating with one another instead of trying to force messages down each other's throats. Policy instead of manual interaction, instead of pulling strings like puppeteering, you're specifying policy, setting guidelines for independently, um, for independent implementation. This is the key to multi-tenancy, to sharing, to, to living together, working together, um, and it scales at all different levels. So I think this is, for me, this is an exciting way of looking at systems, which comes very much from a physicist's point of view. And now, we're not only able to consider the sort of these, these long-term trends that Jeffrey was talking about, but we're actually able to specify our intent at a much lower level and design outcomes with greater predictability than we've been able to do before. And I think that's pretty key to human uh, civilization. So when you look at this picture again now, what do you see? What I see is promises everywhere, on signs, on technology, on bicycles, on people. Every part of this picture is promising something. And underneath, the street level, there are utilities promising things invisibly as well. Keeping promises that we rely on every day in our day-to-day -day lives without even thinking about. And that's the essence. When you can trust promises to be kept, if you can consider a system as being dependable as a set of promises, then that pain of interaction, the cost of the interaction, seeps away. It's very cheap to trust something to be able to rely on something dependable and know that it will scale dependably. First time I saw Chinatown, I thought, holy moly, whoever put this thing up, does anybody maintain it? But it kind of lives on, right? I mean, these, uh, these things are ubiquitous around the world and, and they just, it looks like an impossibly unruly um, ecosystem or jungle of stuff and yet it works. It's kind of, it's messy, it's not tidy, but it works, it really does scale. Part of our prejudice, of course, is that we want tidy because that's how our, you know, our minds, our psychology works. But scaling is something different from tidy and that's also some, a lesson that we'll, we'll have to learn. If you'd like to know uh, a little more about these thoughts, I've written all kinds of stuff about this. The height of the book is proportional to the difficulty so the, the, the bedtime reading one on the left-hand side, that's by cartoons. The one in the middle is, is text with pictures and the one on the right-hand side's got formulae and mathematics and, and stuff like that. So I, I would be honored if, uh, if any of you thought that this was uh, uh, worth studying a little bit more, interested in more of the details, then I'd be happy to uh, talk to you about it and, and uh, you may find something of interest here as well. That said, um, I wish you a wonderful cup of coffee. I'm not imposing it upon you, but I promise that it will taste good after this very long session. So thank you very much.